afternoon. Thanks a lot for uh, having me. Today I will talk about um, geometric deep learning on complexes. So these are some topological spaces that show up a lot in algebraic topology and differential geometry. Uh, and I think it will be very instructive to see how some of the concepts of geometric deep learning that you have encountered in earlier talks kind of apply to new types of spaces. Um, so first, let me give you an overview of this presentation. So it's uh, mostly based um, on these two papers I've collaborated with uh, Fabrizio on. Uh, so Fabrizio will give the second part um, of, of this time slot. Um, and the talk is split basically in uh, two parts. So one is on simplicial complexes. Uh, and we're going to talk about some something called orientations that we associate with these things, how we define signals, which are co called chains. Uh, a bit of topology theory, which, which is called like Hodge theory. Uh, we're going to look at convolutions on these spaces, symmetries, some applications. And then we're going to transition to these more general types of spaces that are called cell complexes. We're going to see what they are. Um, we're going to see how they can help with expressive power, which you've encountered uh, probably in the previous lectures. Uh, we're going to see how we can do message passing on these things. And we're going to end with another applications on molecules. Uh, all right, so that's about it. Let's get uh, started. So uh, first, let me give you like a very, very brief motivation for why we actually care about all these things. Um, so you should understand the motivation for these works or looking at these spaces in relation to certain limitations of uh, graph neural networks. So, and graphs in general, uh, one limitation for instance is that they don't, uh, capture groupwise interaction. So an edge always will, will express a binary interaction. But what happens if you have like three things that interact concurrently, like in a chemical reaction, you might have some reactants that interact at the same time. And it's something that looks like a hypergraph or something like the spaces we're gonna see today. Um, another uh, thing is related to higher order structures, which are uh, very important for certain applications like in molecules. Um, but graph neural networks often don't, are not capable to actually detect very simple structures such as triangles. Um, and we see there are going to be advantages from represent, representing these structures explicitly. Um, something else that shows up is that we might have problems with signals defined on something other than nodes. So we could have signals defined over the edges or even over triangles in a graph and so on. And there's a question of how should we process these signals in a principled way? How can we define convolutions? And we're going to see a topological perspective on how that could be done. Um, expressive power is something that, that I've mentioned on the previous slide. So GNNs are, are upper bounded by this WL test or, or classic GNNs, at least, or, or, or the first uh, iterations of these models. And we're going to see how choosing the right underlying space is related to this. Um, and finally, long-range interactions. So if you want to capture long-range interaction in graph neural network, you actually need a lot of layers or you need as many layers as the distance between these nodes that interact. Um, so we're going to see how we can actually avoid these sort of uh, problems. How can we uh, capture long-range interactions without a ton of layers? Um, and finally, there's many connections with differential geometry and algebraic topology and what I'm going to talk. So uh, hopefully the math will also be interesting. All right. So uh, the first thing we're going to talk about are simplicial complexes. So what is a simplicial complex? Um, well, we start, we start with a non-empty vertex set. So just like with the graph, we have a bunch of vertices. Um, and then a simplicial complex is simply a collection of non-empty subsets of this vertex set. Um, we called uh, the elements of this collection, we call them simplices. Um, and this collection has some extra properties. So it contains all the singleton subsets of V. So basically it contains all the vertices. Um, and importantly, it's closed undertaking subsets. Now this might seem a bit abstract, but let's look at some examples. So a first simplicial complex, um, hopefully you can see my cursor uh, uh, so you can see where I'm pointing. So uh, we, uh, we have this simplicial complex on the left. Um, so before, below it, we can see what this uh, collection looks like. So we have one, two, three, and four, the vertices. Uh, we must have all the singletons. And then we also have these, uh, these uh, sets with two, two elements. So we have one, two corresponding to the edge one, two. We have one, three corresponding to the edge one, three, and so on. Um, now we call the vertices zero simplices because they're zero, we call them zero, they're zero dimensional. 
and we call these uh, edges, these uh, sets of size two, we call them uh, one simplices. So uh, as you see, this is a graph and any graph is a simplicial complex, but we, we don't have to stop there. We can actually have sets with more than two elements. And that's what this other example on the right shows. It's another simplicial complex. Um, we still have vertices one, two, three, and four. We have slightly different uh, edges. But what's new here is that we also have this triangle. Uh, so we have one, two, three, which sort of forms like a hyper edge, if you want. Um, and that expresses this higher order interaction between nodes one, two, and three. Um, now, note that we have this subset inclusion property. So if we have one, two, three, this set in this collection, then we should, all, we should have all the subsets of one, two, three. So we have one, two, we have one, three, we have two, three, uh, and also one, two, three, um, they're all present. So we, we need to have this subset inclusion. All right, um, so, so these are simply show complexes. Um, now, often we uh, work with something called orientations. So with each simplex, we can associate an orientation. Now we treated the simplices as sets, but we could treat them as tuples. So if I say uh, here on the left, two, one, um, I consider this edge to one, but uh, you could imagine this as moving from node one towards, uh, from node two to, towards uh, node one. Or I could say one, two, which means I'm moving from node one to node two. So it's orientation sort of express this, uh, this action of movement, uh, if you want, along that edge. Now, this is also valid for two simplices. So if I say one, two, three, it means I'm going, um, I'm rotating sort of uh, around this triangle in this order. So I'm going one, two, three, or we could have one, three, two. So I'm, I'm kind of going the other way around uh, clockwise or, and the first one was uh, anti-clockwise. So these are orientations. And we talk, when we talk about oriented simplices, we use this tuple notation as opposed to set, um, just to show we, we have an ordering of the vertices. Um, now, something important to note is that there are actually only two unique um, orientations uh, if we ignore the starting point. So uh, with the edge, it was obvious you either go like from left to right or right to left on the edge, right? But it's kind of similar with, with these triangles as well. Like we can either go clockwise or anti-clockwise. Uh, ignoring the starting point, we only have these two uh, types of orientations. Um, and that, that's what uh, this says at the bottom. We have these two equivalence classes, essentially. So uh, whether we talk about one, two, three, for instance, uh, or two, three, one, we actually get the same sort of rotation. So these, these equivalent one correspond to even permutation, and the other equivalence class correspond to the odd permutations of these things. Now, once we picked an orientation for the simplices, we can actually talk about an oriented simplicial complex. So that's just a simplicial complex where we chose an ordering for each of the simplices we have in there. Um, and uh, here's like a, an example of that. So you can see I've just put some arrows on each simplex kind of indicating how it, uh, how it is oriented. And once we have something like that, because we have multiple simplices put together, uh, the ones that are sort of adjacent we can talk about their relative orientation. So to, to give you some examples, if we look at one, two, three, um, and two, three, we can say they have the same orientation because the arrow of two, three is actually pointing in the same uh, direction as the arrow of, of one of the triangle one, two, three. Um, another example is that these two triangles, so for instance, if you look at one, two, three, and one, two, zero, um, they have the same orientation with respect to these lower dimensional simplex they share, this one, two. So if you look at this uh, edge, one, two, it po the arrow points in the same direction as both of these, uh, the direction of both of these triangles. Um, so the arrows uh, sort of agree. Um, now to see like uh, another uh, different example, for instance, zero, one and zero, two, um, they have different orientations with respect to the triangle. They are part of the two simplex they are on the boundary of. So the, these are here for zero one, it, it agrees with the orientation of the triangle, but the other one is against the orientation of the triangle. So that's why we say they have different orientations with respect to the triangle. All right, so hopefully, hopefully these examples are uh, clear. Now, um, why, you, why do we actually care about these orientations and why, why do we need them? Um, well, we can define some vector spaces, um, and these vector spaces are, are called uh, 
well, the elements of these vector spaces are called K chains. Uh, and they essentially a vector space where the basis is given by these oriented K simplices. And we have some real coefficients in front of, of these uh, simplices. Um, and why is this useful is because we can do some useful algebra with these things. So here are some examples. So if you look at the, at the uh, a one chain, so the C1 here, that basically means uh, we're looking at the one simplices with some coefficients in front. So here's an example. We can have something like 2.5 times these uh, oriented simplex, 0, 1, minus 3, 4, uh, plus 3.14 times um, these other oriented simplex, 1, 3. Um, also notice this is equivalent. We, we can flip the sign of this thing. So this minus 3, 4, we can actually write it as plus 4, 3. So we, we swapped the orientation of this thing, which also swap, uh, swapped the flip the sign. Uh, now we can also look at uh, uh, a two chain. So that's uh, in the vector space of these triangles. So for instance, we could have five times 0, 1, 2, plus 1.3, this other triangle, 1, 2, 3. All right. So this might seem a bit abstract, but you're going to see um, on this slide that we can actually do some useful computations with this algebra. So we can define uh, what's called the boundary operator. Um, and it goes from the, the, the k chains to the k minus 1 chains. Uh, so what does it actually do? So if we apply this operator, um, notice these are vector spaces, so uh, we can just specify this operator based on how it acts on the basis or how it acts on each on each k simplex. So if we have we have this oriented k simplex, we apply this boundary operator. Well, it acts like this. Uh, now this what this notation means is that when you have a hat on this thing, you sort of you remove it from the tuple. So just consider removing each of these uh, each of these vertices uh, one by one. Uh, in this sum, uh, why do we remove them? Is because if you remove one of them, you get uh, you get another simplex that's that's on its boundary. So in this example, if we have uh, v zero, v one, v two, if I remove v two, I just get v zero, v one, which is on the boundary of the triangle. So what this says is uh, the boundary of this thing is a sum of the things that it, uh, of the lower dimensional simplices on its boundary, and we also need to to use this minus one in front to take into account the right orientations. Now, this might still seem uh, abstract, so it's useful to look at an example. So if we apply this boundary operator on, on this oriented triangle, V0, V1, V2, uh, oriented as you see in this uh, image, um, well, we can just apply this definition uh, from above, and we get the following. So we get the simplex V1, V2 minus V0, V2 plus V0, V1. Uh, as before, we can flip the sign of, of this second term, and we get v1, v2, plus v2, v0, uh, plus v0, v1. So we actually got this second part of this diagram. We, we got this boundary, right? It's very intuitive. Like, if you think of this triangle, what would you say it's its boundary? Well, it's, it's these edges that it has on its boundary, right? And notice that we get these edges with the right orientation. So it, it agrees with the orientation the triangle had, um, the, these arrows in the second part of the diagram. Um, now, what we can do, we can compute this boundary of the second thing we have, we've obtained. And because it's just a loop, so this triangle with nothing inside is just a loop, so it has no boundary. So we should get zero when we compute its boundary. Um, so that's why I'm doing like in this equation two here. So I'm just computing the boundary of what we computed above. Um, because this operator is linear, this amounts to just applying the boundary to, to uh, all the terms we had above in equation one. And we just get the vertices uh, of this triangle with some signature. And you can see they all cancel each other, and we get 0 in the end. So you, you see how we, by considering these vector spaces, we actually can perform some useful computations like this that reflect some very intuitive notions, such as the boundary of, of some object. All right. Um, now, these boundary operators, because they are linear operators between finite dimensional vector spaces, they have a matrix representation. And I thought it might be comforting to actually see how these matrices look like rather than the abstract operator. Um, and here I'm showing like the, the boundary uh, operator one. Uh, so you actually uh, probably encountered this before. So this is just uh, the incidence matrix of the graph, right? So it just says how vertices are, are, which vertices are incident to which edges, but we also consider some signature. So if we look at edge uh, one, 
uh, the source node of edge one, that's V1, shows up with a minus one, and the target node of that edge shows up with a plus one. And that's that's how um, I've added all the columns here for all the other edges. Uh, but we can generalize this thing. So we look at, at the B2 boundary operators, so the, the matrix of the, of, uh, of the second boundary operator. And this one shows the incident structures of edges to these two simplices or triangles. Um, and here I've just put a one when the orientation of the edge agrees with the orientation of the triangle or a minus one other ones. Uh, so for instance, for this first triangle, T1 on the left, uh, edge one, as we saw before, goes against the orientation of the triangle. So we have a minus one, the others agree. So these are a plus one. All right. Now, uh, the reason I, I've mentioned these boundary matrices is because um, we can use them to define a Laplacian uh, and it's called the Hodge Laplacian. So this is just operator, an operator from the linear operator from the K chains to uh, the K chains. Um, and it looks like this. So it has two parts. It has a lower Laplacian and an upper Laplacian. And the lower Laplacian is obtained for, by multiplying uh, these boundary matrices like this. And the upper Laplacian is given by this other multiplication of the next boundary matrices. Um, now, importantly, um, something to notice is that L0, it's actually formed by uh, this B1 times B1 transpose. B0 is just 0, so that's why it doesn't show up here. Um, and you might recognize that this is actually the graph Laplacian. So it's just the diagonal, um, the diagonal matrix with the degrees of the nodes minus the adjacency matrix. Um, and so the, the usual Laplacian is just a particular case of the Hodge Laplacian. But with this, we get the Laplacian for the edges. Uh, that's L1, a Laplacian for the triangles, and so on. Um, now we can look a bit more closely at how these Laplacians uh, look like. So. Uh, for instance, if we look at the lower Laplacian here, on the diagonal, we're just going to have the dimension uh, of the simplices plus one. And for um, uh, for when i is different from j, and these simplices sigma i and sigma j um, are lower adjacent. So what I mean by that, they share these lower dimensional simplex, like we saw with the triangles before they have this common edge between them. So that means they are lower adjacent then they're going to have a plus or a minus one. And the signature of that will depend on how they are relatively oriented with each other. So if they are oriented in the same way with respect to this lower dimensional simplex, it's going to be a one. Otherwise, it's going to be a minus one. And obviously, we have zero otherwise, but we have no connections. It's just a zero. Now, the upper uh, Laplacian, well, we have this upper degree uh, for on the diagonals for, for the simplices. What's the upper degree? Well, it's just how many how many simplices the simplex is on is uh, is on the boundary of? So, for instance, for for nodes, this is just the usual degree because it just says how many edges that node is on the boundary of. That's that's what uh, we mean by the usual degree in, in a graph, right? And this is generalized uh, for these higher dimensional things. Um, and for uh, non-diagonal entries, when we have what's called an upper adjacency, um, so upper adjacency means two simplices they are on the boundary of the same thing. So two edges could be like on the boundary of the same triangle. Then again, we're going to have plus minus one, depending on, on their relative orientations, or a zero otherwise. Um, now, I've put here a set of references that you will be able to check at the end of the slides. Uh, they're also on the Google Drive. So you can check more details about these Laplacians and their properties. Unfortunately, there is not uh, too much time to cover uh, many things uh, here. All right. Um, now, the main. Theoretical apparatus of these things is based on Hodge theory. Um, and I just want to give you like some, some insights or highlights from this uh, without actually any proofs uh, because they're useful and they kind of show up everywhere uh, and it's good to be aware of them. So a first lemma that kind of uh, underlies everything is that the boundary of a chain has no boundary. So if we perform this composition, we just get zero. Um, and that makes sense. Like we looked at an example before well, if we compute the boundary of something, we might get, you know, we get something like this, like a, a loop. And obviously the loop has no boundary, so we should get zero in the end. Uh, and you could imagine this with pretty much anything. If you take the boundary of a boundary, you will always get nothing basically because there is no boundary. Um, 
Now, some this this fact can be used to prove some uh, these two theorems here. So these k chains can be decomposed into like these three orthogonal subspaces. So you have the image of these boundary operator transpose, um, the kernel of the Hodge Laplacian in that dimension, and the image of the next boundary operator k plus one. Uh, so what this essentially says, you can decompose these signals over over the k-dimensional simplices into uh, the upper uh, the upper adjacent parts, the lower adjacent. Uh, so the upper adjacent uh, parts is this k plus one. The lower adjacent parts plus some extra term, this kernel of the Laplacian. Now we can actually understand a bit better what this kernel of the Laplacian looks like. Um, and it is uh, isomorphic with this uh, HK, which is called the Kate homology group. Um, now we're gonna, not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but it's defined like this. So you can take the kernel of this operator and take the quotient with the image of the next operator. Uh, and intuitively what this corresponds to are topological features, namely uh, holes in your surface. So uh, that basically, for instance, here on this image on the right, you can see this hole in the middle of this simplicial complex. So you, you should see all the triangles in this thing as two simplices. They're they are not filled in, but there are two simplices. Um, and uh, what you have inside is this hole. And if you actually look at the, at the zero eigenvector from, from this kernel of this Laplacian, and you plot it, um, lighter tones show, show higher intensity of this vector, it's very concentrated on this hole in the middle. So there is a, a strong connection basically between the kernel of this space and these holes in, in our surfaces. All right, now that we have a Laplacian operator, we are ready to compute some, uh, to, to invent some uh, convolutional operators. And in particular, we look here at the convolutional operator of our edges, so one chains. Um, and I just wanna point out, there are many concurrent works on this topic that I've listed here, uh, but we're just gonna look at like a very specific one, which I've written down in this equation. So imagine you just have some feature matrices. You have this X zero, which is just your regular feature matrix over the nodes that you have might have encountered for GNNs. But then you also have a feature matrix for um, edges. Uh, F here is the number of channels, so how many columns you have. Um, and X two is a feature matrix for the triangles. So T here stands for the number of triangles. Um, and you could think of each column of this thing as a chain. So here, this is a, a bunch of columns of zero chains, one chains, and two chains. Uh, and we can just form a convolution that's very similar to GNNs, where we just put the, uh, the Laplacian theory, we put the lower Laplacian times, times the, uh, the features times some weight matrix. And we can do this for all these components. So we could look at the upper Laplacian as well. We could look at boundary, uh, the boundary matrix where we've put the features of the, of the nodes. So we map them, the features of the nodes to the features of the edges. And uh, here we have put the B2 boundary matrix and we map the features of the triangles to the features of the, of the edges. Uh, and then we put some nonlinearity at the end. And this can also be seen as a form of message passing as Fabrizio and I have shown in, in our paper. Now, uh, let's look a bit at the symmetries of these um, operators. So a simplicial complex of dimension D uh, can, can be uh, specified by all its boundary matrices. So you just have you know, these incident structures, essentially you, have, you, you say how nodes are connected to edges, how edges are connected to triangles and so on going up uh, if you have more dimensions. So this is just given by all the boundary matrices uh, which describe the structure. Now we can similarly define uh, a bunch of permutation matrices of, of the right dimensions. And then we can apply these permutations to these boundary operators. Um, so we shouldn't care about the ordering uh, of, of the vertices or of the edges or of the triangles, like in GNNs where we don't care about the ordering of the nodes, but here we have also these higher dimensional things. Um, so uh, we can permute them like this. So that means permute the, the rows of this thing and permute, permute the columns, uh, which corresponds here for this operator, permute the, no the nodes and the edges, and so on. We can just permute all these operators and write it like this. Um, and then we can define when a function uh, going from um, these k-chains, again, to the k-chains with 
different feature channels, potentially a number of channels, is permutation equivariant when they respect this equation. Um, and it's very similar to uh, you've seen for GNNs, it's just that now we have more things to permute here uh, because we have more structure, uh, but essentially it looks very similar. Um, and we should obtain the same thing as not permuting anything at all, but permuting the, the features we obtain at, at the end of the, of the layer. All right, and we can see uh, that a convolutional layer like the one we've obtained uh, before, I, I've uh, removed some terms from there just to kind of keep things simple, is permutation equivariant. And it's very easy to see that, uh, you know, we just apply basically this, this definition and we just permute these boundary matrices. So if we perform these calculations and permute and observing that, that the transpose of a permutation is its own inverse, uh, some of these permutations will cancel out here and you're gonna get something like this at the end. So we, we just um, permuted the output features of, of, uh, of this expression in the parentheses at the end. And uh, this, this also, you can also factor in the, the nonlinearity in here and it will uh, still hold. All right, a more advanced type of orientation uh, of, a, of a symmetries orientation equivariance, uh, which is more special to simplicial complexes. Um, so why do we care about this? So we saw when we were doing this algebra that we could just flip at any moment the orientation of something. And then we also flip the sign in front, the coefficient in front uh, of that uh, simplex. And we could choose any orientation. It doesn't really matter what orientation we keep, it's, we, we use, it's just bookkeeping basically. So, so all this algebra works, but you know, any orientation works. So we should, we should be aware of this symmetry. So here's uh, a simple example. So if we have this feature that's uh, is just three, so um, associated with this uh, oriented edge, let's say we flip the edge, well, this will become minus three, this, this coefficient, right? Um, now, suppose we want to apply a function to, to these uh, three here. So we get f of three below, and then we permute, or we go the other way around. So we, we got minus three original, then we originally, then we apply f, and we want these th the two things to commute to preserve the symmetry. So we get minus f of three equals f of minus three. Um, and what this means is that this function f must be uh, an odd function. It's, it's actually the exact property on a, of an odd function. Um, so it should commute with the minus sign, essentially. Now, a bit more uh, of an intuition of what it means to actually uh, switch the, change the orientation. So if I change the orientation of a simplex, what that means is that I flip my relative orientation with respect to anything I'm, I'm adjacent to, right? So. Here with these uh, red highlights, I've, I've, um, I've uh, wanted to show uh, two simplices, this triangle and this edge that I flipped the orientation for. And what happened, the corresponding columns and rows in the boundary matrices, they got multiplied by minus one. Uh, so edge six, for instance, um, multiplied by minus one, uh, this column in boundary matrix one. Uh, and we also multiplied this row in boundary matrix two because edge six also shows up there. And we also flip this triangle. So we also um, flip that column uh, and we just get these, uh, these sign flips essentially. Now, how, how do we model these things? Well, it's just, uh, we can just use some diagonal matrices um, of the corresponding dimensions and the diagonals are the plus or minus one. So these diagonal matrices just realize these flips basically. Um, and as before, we can just have a bunch of them and then we can apply them to the boundary matrices like before, and we apply them from the left and the right to flip the, the rows and the columns. Um, and the formula looks exactly like before, it's just that now we have uh, for equivariance, it's just that we have a different operator and uh, everything works as before. We can show that um, this proposition, this, uh, this convolutional operator we, we defined before is, is uh, there's a type here, should have said orientation equivariant, um, when this psi is odd. So uh, this nonlinearity we apply must be an odd function. And to see why, if we perform again the same calculations, again, the transpose of one of these T matrices, it's also the inverse of a T matrix. Um, and we get to something like this. And now we want this T1 to, to uh, commute with psi because we want to have psi of L1, X1, W, which was our convolution. And 
uh, they do commute when psi is an odd function because it, it commutes with a, with a negative sign. Um, all right, so now let's look at an application of this thing. And uh, what we are looking at are trajectory classifications. So here we represent trajectories as one chains and we actually do need orientation for that because we wanna say, how did we move along this edge? Did we go from left to right when we had the trajectory or did we go from right to left? And you need orientations for that, right? You need to pick an orientation. And then we say, you know, we have a one if we moved in the same direction as that orientation or a minus one if we move the other way around on that edge. Um, and we design like a synthetic uh, task here uh, at the top, uh, which is actually inspired from this paper from Schaub. Um, and we need to classify some random walks like these red and blue ones that you see here. And another real world task is we have some ocean drifter trajectories around Madagascar, and we want to classify between clockwise and anti-clockwise trajectory uh, around the island. Um, and we have some, some benchmarks here. And to make the, the task more challenging for non-equivalent architectures, we flipped randomly the orientations at test time. Um, and as you can see from this table, it confuses a lot uh, the simplicial network. So uh, MPSN stands for message passing simplicial network, but uh, in this case, it's, it's a convolution like the one we've seen. Uh, when we use these uh, non-odd activation functions like ReLU, they could fit the training data set, but they're massively confused on the test set. So they, they just perform randomly there. Um, and that's what happens on both data sets. But when we use uh, odd activation functions like the identity or the hyperbolic tangent, we can see we get very good generalization uh, properties. And this also performs uh, better than, than uh, GNNs. All right, so this ends the part on simplicial complexes. Uh, let's see how I'm doing with time. I think we started at 10 past, so probably I still have uh, a bit more. Um, so um, what's, what's the motivation for the cell complexes? So we're, simplicial complexes have this subset inclusion property that we've seen. So if we have like this higher order interaction, we should also have all the piecewise interactions, all these uh, subsets, right? Which is a bit constraining, but we still like all this theory that, that I've showed you, the Hodge theory and so on, uh, and all these topological tools. So, you know, can we relax these spaces uh, somehow, but still have access to these top, uh, topological tools? And it is possible by considering a slightly uh, more general type of space that's called a cell complex. Um, so I have a definition for this. Um, now, if it sounds too abstract, don't worry too much about it. I think it will be important to understand the example. Uh, but the definition sounds like this. So a regular cell complex is a topological space. So just a space, and it's formed from uh, a couple of pieces, like a puzzle, if you want, uh, uh, which are disjoint. So it's formed of these disjoint subspaces, uh, and, and the pieces of this puzzle are called, of this puzzle are called cells. Um, and these cells uh, have some uh, restriction. So each cell is homeomorphic to uh, Rn for some n that depends on the cell. And the closure of each cell is homeomorphic to a closed ball in Rn. Now, wh what does that actually mean? Uh, if you're not familiar with homeomorphism, that just says um, you are able to, to deform, if you think of these things as being formed of rubber or something like that, you can deform one thing into another. Um, so if you look here, for instance, this blue thing here, this blue cycle, um, it's homeomorphic to a disk if you also consider its boundary. So that's what I mean by its closure. You also look at this boundary. Well, it looks like this disk, but it, you know, it's just stretched a bit. So it, it takes this particular uh, shape and similarly with this bigger one here. Now also all these edges, well, they are homeomorphic to, to a line segment, which is one dimensional. All the vertices in this thing are homeomorphic to, to a, a point, right? The zero dimensional thing. Uh, so you just basically use this homeomorphic um, uh, maps and you just put these pieces of the puzzle together. Uh, that's, that's what a cell complex is. So with respect to simplicial complex, now we don't only have triangle as the only two dimensional thing. We can have any sort of surface like this with, with more things on its boundary, not, not just a triangle. We can have any sort of uh, polygon like this. All right, hopefully that makes sense. Um, and now, uh, how do we construct something like this? Um, so it's actually quite, quite simple. Uh, we could start with some sort of graph. Um, you start with a set of vertices, you put some edges on top, 
uh, which again, it actually follows the same procedure. You, you take some line segments and you glue their endpoints to some of these vertices and you obtain a graph. And then you, you can go further. You just take these two dimensional disks right like here and you, you look for cycles in your graph and you just put, you just glue it um, to one of these cycles. Like here, we glue two of these to two cycles and we obtain a, a two dimensional cell complex. So we have added what uh, these what are called two cells or two dimensional cells. Uh, the edges are one cells uh, and the vertices are zero cells. That's the terminology in this uh, language. Um, now we can also define um, a WL uh, algorithm for, for this thing. So we, you've seen like this color refinement procedure on graphs and we can perform something similar on a cell complex. So if we have a color associated with each cell in, in the cell complex, we can just hash the colors of the neighbors. The, neighbor, the neighborhood structure is the same with simplicial complexes. So we have these lower adjacencies, these upper adjacencies. We have these, these, element, these other cells on the boundary of others and so on. Um, so we can just put all these colors for all the adjacent things defined in various ways, and then we hash them and then we compute a new color. And actually when you do something like this, you can show that you can get rid of some of these adjacencies and you don't lose any expressive power. So for instance, you could get rid of the lower adjacencies and you can also get rid of the co-boundary adjacencies. So that means things you're on the boundary of. So it's kind of the opposite of, of, of the boundary relation. Um, right, and, and why, why is this useful? Where you can actually be more powerful than the WL test by doing this. So you, you start with the graph, you can attach the cells to the graph in various ways. So for instance, you could add it to the clicks in your graph, you could add it to the induced cycles, you could add it to the simple cycles in your graph, uh, or up to some size for these substructures. So you could just put them there. Um, and then you obtain a cell complex and then now you can perform color refinement on what you obtained. And if you, you follow this procedure for some values of this K, the maximum uh, size of the substructures you consider, uh, you get strictly more powerful than the WL test. And this shows some examples of that. So these are two pairs with the WL color rings on them. Uh, you probably saw these examples already or some of them. And you can see they produce the same histograms, WL can't distinguish them. But if you consider, for instance, these triangles as a two cell, um, then, well, this one has triangles, the, one, the other one doesn't have. So it's trivially not the same cell complex. Also similarly with these two molecules here, if you consider these cycles as a two cell, well, they are, uh, this one, the size of this cycle is different from the size of this cycle. So uh, it's trivially non-isomorphic uh, when, when you look at them as cell complexes. Um, now you can also perform message passing on these things uh, by following these sort of adjacencies. Uh, and this looks a lot like um, the GNN message passing. It's just that now you have this whole hierarchy, you have edges, you have two cells. Uh, but what you do, you, you have uh, a boundary message from, from uh, which is shown here by these uh, orange arrows. So uh, a cell gets a message from all its boundary um, uh, uh, cells. Um, and you also have these upper adjacencies. So things that are on the boundary of the same thing, they communicate. This is what these blue arrows uh, show. So all the, these edges in this cycle communicate with each other because they're on the boundary of this simplex uh, sigma. Um, you update, you update the features by just using these boundary messages. And at the end, you can also obtain a final representation for the cell complex by aggregating all these representations. Um, now, what are the advantages of this approach? Um, is that you have, you, for, first you have superior expressive power, as I already mentioned. Another advantage is that you explicitly model these higher order structures like these cycles um, and you also model them in the sense that you associate features with them. So each cycle, all, each of these two cells will have a feature associated with them. Um, they're also hierarchical. So they add this hierarchical inductive bias to the computational graph. And it's easier to capture long range interactions with these things because these two cells create shortcuts uh, in some sense. So even if like two edges are on the opposite side of a, of a ring, they are far from each other. In some sense, they are close uh, because they are joined by this, this higher dimensional two cell that puts them together. And 
you know, let, let me show you some, some examples with uh, what you can do with this. So molecules have been modeled as graphs for a very long time, um, but it's not necessarily uh, uh, the best representation, even though it's a very natural one, but an equally natural one or even better is uh, a cell complex representation. So you could think of all the chemical rings in a molecule as a two cell. And uh, that, that's what this diagram shows. The bonds between atoms will still be vertices like before, uh, and uh, the atoms will be vertices. So the rest keeps the same structure like when we use graphs, but we have these additional two cells. And then once we, we perform this transformation, we can perform message passing on these, on these molecules like we do in, in GNN when we use GNN for uh, molecules. And it turns out this is actually a very good idea uh, so we, uh, Fabrizio and I have done this um, in, in our paper at NeurIPS. And once you do this, you actually uh, obtain state, we obtain state-of-the-art results for molecular property prediction problems. So for zinc, you need to uh, predict the solubility of certain molecules. And for mole HIV, you need to predict the, you know, the capacity of certain compounds to inhibit HIV uh, replication, I believe. Um, and we have, we've obtained state-of-the-art results that outperforms other, other GNNs. So, so this shows all these advantages actually also translate in uh, actual uh, superior results. Um, all right, so I think I'm at the end. Hopefully we have some time for uh, questions. I just noticed there are some uh, messages in the chat. Um, so uh, for more learning resources, if you want to learn more about this, uh, I've put here uh, two references. So. Uh, the first one is a course from Oxford on computational algebraic topology. Um, and the view in this talk was primarily topological, but there is actually a, a dual view of everything I've presented based on co-chains and discrete differential forms that comes from uh, discrete differential geometry. And there is this, call, uh, this course from Kiran Crane at CMU on discrete differential geometry uh, that it's really cool. And I also like invite you to have a look if you're interested to learn more. Um, all right, so there's a bunch of references here if you want to check out the details. Um, uh, and with that, uh, thank you very much and happy to take any questions.